Well, hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Brand Builder Show. In today's episode, we are chatting to Matthew Holman from QPilot, and we're talking all about subscriptions, recurring revenue, what kind of products subscriptions work for and which kind of products they don't, how to improve conversion rate for subscriptions, how to decrease churn rate, all of the important metrics that you need to be aware of if you're gonna run a successful subscription model within your e-commerce brand. If you like episodes like this, be sure to like this episode on YouTube, subscribe on your favorite podcast player. And if you want to hear more from us, do sign up to our newsletter at brandbuilderuni.com slash subscribe. Now let's get into the episode. Awesome. Well, hey, Matthew, uh, welcome to the Brand Builder Show today. Thanks for coming on the episode. Absolutely. Thanks, Ben. Uh, it's going to be a good one talking about uh, all things at subscriptions, recurring revenue, all those juicy words that uh, e-commerce brand owners <laughs> love to love to hear, but sometimes struggle to implement and find solutions for. So we're going to try and make right. this a real practical episode, find some solutions and help people optimize if they are already running subscriptions. And so it's going to be uh, action packed, full of lots of info. Uh, before we get into that, Matthew, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself, about how you found yourself doing what you're doing today? today yeah absolutely um so yeah i run um growth uh which is a fancy way of saying marketing at q pilot which is a SaaS company that's delivering great subscription experiences for brands to give to their customers um i do a, lo a lot of work with community um i love building up the e-commerce space um and i kind of it's kind of funny i was actually doing marketing at an e-commerce logistics company so we were selling shipping technology which is pretty boring um but you know, so we had to get a little creative in how we were doing content and education and, and ultimately just kind of want to take the plunge into more of entrepreneurship. So, um, you know, QPilot was looking for a marketing co-founder and I was able to, you know, got connected with the, the founder of QPilot mm -hmm. and learn more about the space and, and dove head in and, you know, two years later, here we are. Yeah. Awesome. And what kind of solution is QPilot? Is it to help uh, merchants run subscriptions on a e-commerce store or is it more specific than that? Yeah, absolutely. So you can think of it kind of like a typical app or plugin that you're adding to your store. And while it's kind of like tip of the iceberg, just doing that initial conversion element, there's a lot that the platform does from an enablement standpoint. Um, ultimately, we like to think of subscriptions are typically viewed as somewhat inflexible. Mm -hmm. So QPilot is really geared towards flexibility. So you can a customer can change literally anything they want on there. Mm -hmm without disrupting the brand's operations. Awesome. So there's a lot of integration work and operational like f logic that we're running mm -hmm. to make sure that the brand can literally sell whatever they want to whoever they want mm -hmm. within a subscription. Okay, awesome. And is it pl platform specific? Uh, no, well, WooCommerce and Shopify okay. specifically yeah, nice. for right now. Yeah, two pretty big players, covers a lot of the market. <laughs> it does, it does. Awesome. Are you, just out on that, out of interest, are you? Uh, what kind of volume do you see for Shopify versus WooCommerce? Because I think Shopify gets talked about a lot, but WooCommerce is actually bigger than a lot of people realize, I think. Yeah, so from like from our own business, we're fairly new to Shopify. So like our own volume is a little bit skewed favoring WooCommerce. Yeah. Um, I think what it's what's interesting is that there are more WooCommerce stores than there are Shopify stores, mm -hmm. but WooCommerce gets used in a lot of different ways than just selling like, you know, I'm shipping pet food mm -hmm. or like a shirt. Like WooCommerce is used for digital subscriptions. There's big brands that are using WooCommerce to manage like a content management system. Mm -hmm. Like basically they want to blogs with WordPress and so they want to be able to take payments. So it gets used in a wider variety of applications but when it comes to just straight e-commerce play it's kind of shopify is kind of undeniable as a as a growing source and i, I think that you'll see you see more established companies doing more revenue um on shopify than you do on woocommerce yeah yeah, definitely. Okay, cool. So let's talk about subscriptions then. There's obviously a, a lot of draw and a lot of talk about recurring revenue subscriptions for obvious reasons, growing customer lifetime value. Right. You know, as marketing gets more expensive, uh, customer acquisition costs grow. You know, something that key really keeps people on the back end, of course, is attractive to e-commerce brand owners. Um, but right at the beginning of that process, is this a model of revenue that every brand owner should aspire to? Is it only for a few? are we only speaking to a narrow audience here what are your thoughts on that yeah i think it's 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 a little bit narrow but it's growing i think the subscriptions are definitely increasing their adoption um and how people feel about them are, are definitely changing in, a, in an upper to the right motion i think really because because i get asked that question a lot right and 
there's a lot of different business models, whether you're talking e-commerce or even service providers and others, like, should I implement a subscription model? And, and, and a, a lot of finance people or your board might say, yes, you got to do this recurring revenue is predictable, but it really needs to come down to a word I'm going to use a lot when we're talking is the word engagement mm. is, is there an opportunity for you to engage um, more with your customers and subscriptions is a really great way to do that. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Do you, um, are there particular, obviously stuff like food, beverages, that kind of thing, because it is a consumable, it's going to really lend itself to a uh, right. subscription model. Do you see that product uh, type widening as well? Are people offering more, uh, you know, product types for this kind of uh, model? Absolutely. Yeah. I think w the way a lot of people have envisioned subscriptions for a long time have been through subscription boxes. Mm -hmm. This idea of like, you know, you're getting this delight, whether it's every month or every quarter, you know, like say you're getting butcher box or you're getting, um, you know, some, some like uh, a cosmetic thing, right. Where they're picking different things for you to try. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's, that's one element. And then you have the one you mentioned, which is consumables, mm -hmm. right. Pet food supplements, CBD is like playing massively into that space right now. And so somebody's using something regularly, they want to get on a subscription. But I think where we're starting to see more innovation too is things related to like refills, right? Like you have an air filter system, right? So you sell the system and then you put the filter on a subscription. Mm. Um, so basically, oh, and also it's coming down to the technology is starting to advance now. So it's less about you using this every month. So you're just going to get it every month. But the ability to kind of schedule the fact that I want something like this every three months because I use it less frequently than you do, or I yeah. want something every six months is, 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 is allowing the space to yeah. continue to grow. Yeah. I've got a few things like on, um, Amazon subscribe and save, um, you know, like just different supplements and coffee and that kind of stuff. And it's so right. flexible, you know, you, they'll remind you when it's coming up and they'll almost prompt you to edit it. And do you want it in that frequency? Do you want to change the quantities? And it's so easy to do. Um, and that's obviously right. where like, I, I stick with it because I know that it's super easy to change. And so I imagine then the retention rate is huge. Um, is that something then that the technology that you guys run helps manage? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. So like from a technical standpoint, it can be difficult, like say within a subscription, maybe you want to double the size of your coffee order. Mm -hmm. Like a, right now, a limit, a, a common limitation with software and brands is that you don't like, say you're are you just eating the shipping cost or are you charging for shipping? Like, do you know how much inventory you have on that product so you can make it available in the subscription portal? Right. Like there's, there's, th there's just little things, logistical things that kind of come up. So to be able to make that possible, you have to solve some of those problems because you want it to be really flexible. Like, you know, you're getting coffee and you're going to be out of town for two weeks on vacation. Mm. Do you want your coffee subscription paused or do you want it redirected to where you're going to be? Mm. Right. Mm. Yeah. That's a great thought. Definitely redirected to where I'm going to be. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. Um, for someone that's just looking at getting started with subscription, recurring revenue, you know, maybe they've got a brand that they feel has potential to lean into it. Uh, what, what is the kind of this? The, what are the starting steps for people um, if they've not done subscription before and they want to kind of explore the avenues? Can you give us a bit of a, sure. like a guide on how to get started? Absolutely. Yeah, let me start with like the things not to do are, you know, you're going to see there's a lot of brands out there that do really, really well with subscriptions. They've got these incredible offerings, right? Like Dollar Shave Club is one that I order. I'm a bald guy, shave my head regularly. They've been doing this for a long time, right? So they have a lot invested in their customer experience and their technology. So the first thing, the, the, the biggest mistake I see people make is they come up with this really complex offering that they want to do. And so like most things, you want to actually kind of keep it as simple as possible, but some of the key fundamentals you want to think about is like, it, first, are you being asked for this? So a lot of brands, if you're selling a consumable product, you should be getting, and you have even just a decent sales volume, you're doing at least a few hundred orders a month, you're, you should be getting requests for a subscription. And if you're not, that's a good place to start asking why. The other thing is thinking about what kind of value am I giving here? Is it just, I know that people are buying this on repeat, so I'm just going to offer a subscription and give them 10% off because that makes it predictable for me. Or is there something more I want to get out of it? And, and the reason I say that is because you want to be collecting data on not just why people cancel, but why people are buying the subscription in the first place. What value are they seeing? What possibility are they seeing? What solution are, are, they, are, they, are they looking for? So any good subscription program should really just be thinking about a basic offering. And I'm going to be collecting data around the acquisition, 
and my, what my conversion rates are, and then also churn reasons. Um, and a lot of times when you're initially doing this, it's you don't get data at scale, so you have to do more outreach and you have to talk to people to find to figure that out. Yeah, definitely. I'd love to talk about some of those stats in terms of sure. you know conversion, retention, churn, etc. Um, you know, let's start with conversion rate. How how do people increase conversion rate with a subscription? Because a subscription is obviously a commitment. I imagine. Um, you know, I, I don't run a subscription model myself, so I you know I imagine the um, one of the biggest um, you know barriers to conversion is going to be well I'm committed to this and it's going to charge my credit card every month what are That's some right. of the things that you would recommend to people starting this process for just getting that initial conversion signing people up on the subscribe option yeah so first things first is thinking about what are the common um, reasons why people don't do subscriptions one is they're worried about ending up with too much product the second one is they're worried about forgetting it Three, they're often wondering if this is something they really need on a consistent basis. So I would start by addressing those three things. One, this is easy to cancel or manage at any time. And that needs to be a pop-up modal or messaging that's like right by the subscription option. Yeah. Um, the second thing is like, if you're worried about having too much product, same thing, it's easy to pause, skip, change the frequency you want. Um, is something important to offer. The third thing is really just a, as a question of messaging and copy, right? Like if you're selling coffee, it might seem like you don't need to emphasize how great the product is and consuming it on a regular basis because most coffee drinkers already know why they're drinking coffee on a regular basis. <laughs> and yet, and yet that is a place where I would start about that. Like, are you, are you asking your fans of your product or potential new fans, like what it's like without coffee on the day that they want it the most, right? Like, are you asking that question? Or are you reinforcing what it's going to be like if they're out? Yeah. You know, and so that, that that's a good place to start with copy and emphasizing like regular usage, consumption, mm. benefit, especially if you have a product that's like solving a problem, right? Like, mm. like it's a, if it's a supplement or something like that. So that's that. Those are the places I would always start. Mm. But then again, that's why I kind of come back to wanting to get into this question of why people are buying it. Um, you can if you just start offering the subscription, you're going to see some conversions, but then you want to kind of understand that that consumer a little bit more. Why did you pick this instead of one time? The dream is to get people into a subscription right away. Mm. But most of the time when you're starting, at least people are going to be um, buying your product a couple times and then subscribing um, or people are willing to try it, but they're just going to cancel if they don't like it. So you, you want to understand those customers a little bit better so you can frame that offer better yeah. to increase conversions. Yeah, I think that's really interesting that, you know, because my initial thought would be, well, I just offer a subscription cheaper, you know, and then people will sign up. But I love how you didn't just straight away go to price. You know, it's about selling the value of it. Copywriting is obviously there, a really important factor. Um, yeah. I think it, it it should be emphasized. You can test price like instantly, mm. right? Like if you want to test a sale over the weekend, you can go in and I mean, you can change update pricing on your website in five minutes, mm. right? So it's always easy to go to there. And so I, I do like saying, saying some of the other things if you want to invest long term. And that's why I say collect data, talk to customers, find out the reason they're buying. Because if you can start to identify some like really interesting ideas of why somebody subscribed versus why somebody didn't, mm. that becomes a, a lever you can pull um, in your marketing, yeah. right? And not just your pr product page, but mm. the actual ads or articles yeah. that are driving people to that page. Yeah, and I imagine that your most successful clients would be utilizing a lot of follow-up email marketing. Someone's purchased once, part of their follow-up flow yep. is then, of course, going to be promoting the subscription. Inserts, definitely. Mm. Like if, you've, if you're on the third order, third mm. one-time order, people are getting inserts about, around subscriptions. Like, hey, you bought this three times. Yeah. Why don't you subscribe and save? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good shout because anybody that's bought it three times would surely be a, a shoe in for a subscription. Yep. That's really good. And so once they're signed up, um, enjoying the subscription or enjoying the product, um, what kind of churn rates do you generally look for? Uh, is it product dependent? Give us some thoughts on that side of things. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things is um, it's really easy to look at. I think most software will show you um, average subscription lifecycle, mm -hmm. like basically how long somebody's around. And I think that that stack can be a little bit misleading because say like your average, um, you know, say you're selling a monthly subscription and say the average is five months. Well, that's that data can be skewed because you might have a, a, a core group of customers that stick around for forever. And then you have a, always there's always with subscriptions going to be a percentage of people that 
sign up for the subscription in month one and they cancel, right? And depending on your business, that, that percentage can vary. So so instead of, I, I, I teach brands, instead of looking at it at an average necessarily to start looking at common drop-off points. And, and what I mean is like, Month zero, you might you have month zero, you have a hundred percent retention. That's your first purchase. But say month one, do you have a ninety percent retention? Meaning you lost ten percent of people before the first subscription fired. Month two, you might have eighty percent. Month three, you might have sixty five percent. Right. So month three, we see that it went from ten percent, ten percent to fifteen percent. Mm. You know, and maybe month seven to eight is like there's like negligible. So I'm really worried about that month three to month seven. So that's kind of what I start getting into is like. Think about the over time, how people are behaving and where your biggest drop off points are. Mm. And that's when you want to get into the why. If you're uncovering reasons why through churn reasons, cancellation reasons, um, understanding behavior, consumption, is it sometimes it's something as simple as, hey, they wanted to try a different flavor. Like mm. they drank this coffee for three months and they were interested in trying something different. Mm. And and so maybe you need to build a little bit of an upsell feature at month two into your flows, right? Mm-hmm. It's like th- those are types of the types of information that you just don't know until you're getting them. If it, are they not seeing enough value on, on that, right? Do you need to do a better job of reinforcing the benefits or reinfor- engaging more with your customers? Is 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 the start the kind of thing you want to get into with the yeah from looking at churn that way? And what are some of the most common, uh, easily solvable reasons that people are seeing churn? You know, if you could identify the top three, five, whatever reasons that people yeah. quit their subscriptions. Yeah, there's a, there's two different ways to look at it. So one of the most common ways is actually a passive churn, which is like credit card credit cards are expiring. And there's tools you can use to do that as well as um, just making sure you have a good communication system in place for when that happens, right? That your software is notifying them via email that mm-hmm. this has happened. Um, and then your customer service team is following up because a lot of times those people are like 60, 70% win back on a canceled credit card. They don't want the subscription to cancel. Mm-hmm. So you need to reach out to them. So that's kind of like passive, but more active is what the essentially the most common reason you see is like people have too much product. So whatever they were getting, they now have too much of. And so uh, a really common practice, especially on Shopify right now is this idea around the skip, right? You want people to push their their order out mm-hmm. Um, you want people to just say, oh, like you have too much, just just push it off into the future. So um, there's some, whether you're using text or whether you're using email, there's a way of engaging with people to let them know that their order is about the process. Um, and depending on your brand, I don't like suggesting the skip. I do like asking people um, how much product they have. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have a ton of data around it because the merchants that are testing that, it's a little bit different. But mm-hmm. For me, I like the psychology around you're not suggesting that they skip right away because yeah. then they'll just do it. Yeah. But around asking somebody to think about how much product they have, mm-hmm. because if they think about it, then they'll then decide whether they should be skipping yeah. or not. So you can build the flow a little bit differently that way. Yeah, I know my Amazon one, it says um, each time they'll it's email or, or text me and it'll say, um, if you need to make changes to your order, go to this link. Right. So it's very, right. yes, yeah, subtle. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned text there. Are you or clients, are your most successful clients, are they utilizing text a lot in this process? A, a lot of them are, but a lot of them are still relying on email. Yeah. You'd be amazed at how many brands are still not implementing at, at SMS in their marketing. Yeah, I, I think the viewpoint on it is definitely changing, isn't it? Because I think you know, a couple of years ago, the idea of text marketing was seen as almost a bit intrusive. Will people even like that? You're getting lots of complaints, but for me, yeah, everyone is saying that it's, it's working really well. It's certainly, it's regulated more tightly than email is. Yeah. So there's a lot of things you can say or can't do within text. But if you think about it as a conversation, um, like the idea of asking somebody like, Hey, like your order is about to process. Like you could say, just say, do you want changes? You say like, how, how is, the product treating you, do you need to make any updates, right? And people can do that right within a text message. They yeah. can reply, it's a web hook, can change, change and update, yeah. up the order, update the order really easily. Yeah. So it's definitely an improved customer experience if people like being communicated with that way. Yeah. And then do you suggest um, like a different way of communicating? Um, I mean, I know I recently tried a new, I'm 
sounding like a subscription junkie here, but I tried a new like <laughs> coffee subscription. I got a new coffee machine and I went from pods to, uh, you know, like actual beans. And so I'm getting the mm-hmm. beans delivered. And, right. um, and so I, I've loved the convenience of it on, on Amazon with the pods, but now I've got the, got the beans. Um, you know, I wanted to maintain that kind of convenience. And so I've signed up for it. And it's, it's a bit different to Amazon because they'll like email me every week, send your orders on the way. They'll kind of send me tips about how to use it. They'll engage me right. in the process of the, you know, the brewing process the educational stuff and obviously i suppose then they are um, e- e- um educating me on how to use get the most out of the product so i enjoy it the best um yeah. uh, and i i suppose then I, I don't mean to answer the question for you but i, I imagine your best clients again must be uh, communicating with their subscribers differently more frequently to their other yes. customers yeah, it's it, it, again. So I mentioned this early on, but the, the term is engagement. So thinking about this brand is engaging with you more. And what I think is really fascinating, like the example you just gave is perfect because what more could they offer you on a subscription to keep you around longer? And if you are roasting your own beans or putting your own beans in this press, it's a little more custom. It's a little bit different. You know, maybe you are a little bit more um, select as a coffee drinker, mm-hmm. right? And so the idea might be that coffee related content, how they curate their beans, how they like develop farming systems and, mm-hmm. and you know, all those things, maybe that's a video that you get access to mm-hmm. that you don't otherwise, right. Or you want to hear from like the coffee expert that that brand uses to yeah. select their beans. Like, would that be fascinating to you? So it's this idea of you can add additional content and, and you want to make it so that people can select some of that, right? So people aren't necessarily getting just spammed all day long. But the idea is you're creating a deeper relationship with somebody. And on the brand side, that means you get more data. Mm. I know I know Ben's consumption of coffee better. I know what he prefers from a flavor standpoint. I know what he likes or doesn't like about his past coffee or, or potentially new mm. coffee. And I can build other products out around that. I can build a better experience around that. Mm. You get just a lot more information and makes the, the engagement, the retention that much stronger. Longer. yeah definitely the example keeping on with the example of the coffee the early on the obvious way to keep me as a customer is yeah educating me on how to use these beans how to grind them in the right way how to um you know use them in my machine in the right way to get the best tasting coffee out of it because then i'm going to enjoy it keep buying it that, that's an obvious one but uh, you know it gets to the point where um, of course I can only learn so much about the coffee and then right. the only reason I'm keeping the <laughs> subscription is because I like the coffee right? Um, right but then there may be other coffees I could try there could be you know different options out there so w- once someone kind of gets into and, and I suppose it would uh, carry across in lots of examples you know uh, face cream mm-hmm. or whatever you know uh, right. how after that initial period of educating the customer what are some things sort of three six twelve months down the line that can keep a customer for a really long time because that's got to be the ultimate goal, right? 12, 24, 36 right. Month customer. Right. So when I was talking about churn earlier, I was mentioning like these common drop-off points and what happens when you're looking at your subscription data as you start to uncover like, Hey, if I can get somebody to month seven, right. Then, then they will be around for two years. Yeah. So the, the retention data is really teaching you from your own customer base. And this is why I, I again, I emphasize the idea behind launching an MVP and not worrying too much about making it too complicated because you actually need a lot of time to, to gather retention data to know what people are doing or not. Yeah. So you actually start to learn like what's what's working. So this brand, I would assume, has a pretty good idea that if they can get you to month six, for example, you're going to stick around for a long time because at that point you have done it all. You've watched the videos, you've consumed it, and now you're just a fan. The idea that you would leave at that point is actually a lot less likely. So this is actually maybe the opposite of an answer is you actually might not have to do as much Mm -hmm. at that point. It's actually more about upsells and other value ads Mm -hmm. you can offer, right? It's like, Hey Ben, you've been with us for, for 12 months. We're going to give you a free month, Mm -hmm. right? We're going to give you a free discount. We don't give this. We only give this to our best customers, Mm -hmm. right? We, whether it's discount, other products, I think upsells are like, if you've been around on with the brand that long, you're going to trust them. You're going to be maybe interested more in trying other offerings they have. That's when you they can really start to unpack more LTV from you. So I would think that it's more about selling directly engaging in that way. Yeah. Um, but, but realistically it's, it's not the retention is a little bit easier, but you also sometimes get less data around that point, right? Somebody between month 12 and month 14, you know, maybe they're just tired of it yeah, yeah. and they just want to do something different. Right. Or, you know, 
decided they have a new job and now there's a Starbucks in the lobby of their job. Mm -hmm. And so they just buy Starbucks every day, you know? So there's, there's some ways where you just can't win that, but, um, it is really about understanding the journey from that initial point, the trial phase, getting to it and getting them over that hump into that green pasture where it's, where it's a lot easier to retain. Yeah, definitely. The brands that are doing this well, what percentage of their revenue is going to be coming from subscriptions? 60 to 70%. Really? That high? Yeah, I like, thought you were going to yeah. say 2025. 20, <laughs> a, lot, a lot. I mean, a lot of brands do subscriptions pretty well and they get 20, 30%, but mm. the ones that are, cause what ends up happening is they start to change their acquisition strategy to go after more and more subscription, mm. um, c- customers that are, will go on a subscription. So, yeah. um, you know, the product page is designed that way. The marketing materials are designed that way. Mm. And so they're looking at converting at a higher rate. So yeah, the best ones, it's like 60, 70%, if yeah. not a lot higher because that ends up becoming the core focus of their business. Yeah. And it would add so much value to the business. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, positioning for an exit, you know, um, getting acquired by, a, right. uh, you know, someone and, um, and that's going to add so much value, isn't it? To, to a business that recurring revenue, that level of it as well. Right. It's such an asset that. Right. Right. So, um, in terms of case studies are obviously I'm, I'm aware you're not able to give all the details of, of clients and stuff like that but are there any kind of key kind of case studies or um you know projects that have gone really well that you can draw on and give influ- um examples of to you know how it was implemented or the changes it made um, yeah anything like that yeah without necessarily getting into like q pilot specific stuff mm. um like you know how great we are because Feel that's just to. maybe that's fine. Fall, yeah. it's a little bit well i mean there there's some fun things i think for the purpose of like the the spirit of our discussion one of the best examples from a case study standpoint is so so i Heart dogs is one of our customers and they do a lot with uh a, a don't they donate pet food to uh shelters based off of like you know you buy cat food they donate cat food right so they, so they have a great humanitarian well maybe you know pet mission on, on what they're doing but um they essentially launched with us for and for around two years they weren't doing much with their subscriptions they were focusing on bringing in like their landed cost and you know how to boost their average order value because the subscriptions wasn't necessarily super profitable for them so but they were collecting data during that time frame, and one of the things that they learned that was really um, like most businesses, people had too much product. That was the, like the number one reason for canceling. And and the reason I bring this up is because of the lesson here, mm. is they started to get into why people had too much product. Because regardless of your brand, there's a reason why people aren't using the product the way you thought they would. And the information that they got on this pet food was that depending on the size of the dog or the cat, you know, cat, well, cats, depending on the size of the dog, people would not be sure how much to order. And so they were churning people because they had a little dog and they had too much food or they had a big dog and they had too little food or they overestimated what they should order. So they went back to the drawing board and redesigned their landing pages so that now when you're on there, that one of the first things you do is you select how big your dog is estimated size. And then it makes a recommendation defaulting to the subscription option on how much food you should get and on the schedule you should get it. And and what they saw was like a like 25% lift in conversions and like a 30 to 40% lift in retention. Nice. So they're basically making a change to the product page made their retention better. Mm-hmm. And so why I emphasize this data so much is because you start to collect reasons on why people cancel. And when you can marry that with the information on what people are thinking or, or trying to figure out on the product page, yeah. you can create this flywheel where you're actually creating this unified holistic experience that's catering to what people's need is for that product. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and that's, I think is the best lesson there. The most success that brands are finding is they're, they're, they're uncovering the reasons why people love the product and and they're doubling down on those so i heart dogs does all this messaging related to you know remember we're donating to shelters because of your purchase yeah. so that that they're hitting that heartstring because that's one of the main reasons why people buy in the first place mm-hmm. and then they're also making sure they overcome their their friction points that the reasons why people churn because they have, they have too much product because they didn't estimate the right size for their dog yeah well now they do a lot better at doing that and helping people figure that out yeah no, that's really good. I love how you mentioned that, how they reinforce the values, the first initial values that right. made someone buy. They continue to reinforce those because it's, it's 
as less um, as much as it is a less um, it's less work to get them to buy the second, third, fourth time if they're subscribed. It still is a transaction, right? You still need to convert them right. each month to keep right. the subscription. So reminding of them uh, of why they purchased is a great idea. And even if something are, is like sorry, go on. oh, well, I was just gonna say a great example I was giving a brand the other day was they were talking about putting gifts. At, at their so they they had identified their biggest drop off point mm -hmm. say it was like month three to four, and they were going to start giving some gifts that were like ancillary to their product mm -hmm. as a means of trying to, but but they people were canceling because they weren't using the product which again is a common problem so the idea is like well you could put inserts into all the boxes to help with the unboxing experience that have like user generated content around the benefits they've seen from mm -hmm. from regular usage on the product and, and the and the cost of printing like you know 10,000 inserts is nothing compared to the cost of like 10,000 gifts yeah. and so so again it's just thinking about ways you can have greater engagement you can reinforce the benefits remind people of why they bought it in the first place it's just common like those are e-commerce basic practices and they should be used within the subscription life cycle too yeah. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And I, I love the thought you shared before as well about setting it up on the initial purchase, you know, that how you frame the purchase and the the copy, the story you tell in the initial purchase conversion is gonna help with the retention. A you know, real key for people to Absolutely. through that. So it's really good. Right? Absolutely. Um, in terms of a couple more questions and then we'll sort of look to wrap up, but a couple of things. Um, in terms of shipping, um, how are most of your clients kind of solving the, the process of shipping? It's all completely automated. They have something kind of hooked in with Shopify, WooCommerce that just picks up the, um, you know, subscription orders and ships them out on time. Yeah, so shipping is a little bit different. Um, I mean, we, we are dependent on the typical order management system. So we're essentially, we're injecting the order into Shopify or WooCommerce, mm -hmm. and then they fulfill as normal as they would for anything else. Okay. Um, if, if, if the order has specific like pick and pack requirements, like say you're triggering um, month three of the order, there's some logic we can use to append to the order so that people know that like it comes up in ship station. Hey, this is a number three. It needs an extra oh, insert yeah. um, kind of thing. There's, there's some functionality there. Um, a lot of the ways that we do really well with shipping is actually related to like like similar cart rules on the subscription orders. So for example, if you want to trigger free shipping on a $75 threshold within the cart, it's easy to do right now. Those are tons of things you can make do that. We do that on the subscription order. So if you want people to incentivize them to increase the average order or the order value on their subscription, you can use shipping rules for that. If you wanted to make certain products free shipping or uh, or not, um, you can do that within ours as well. Yeah, nice. And then the last question I just had was about more like bespoke subscriptions, you know, like uh, clothing uh, is, is one I've seen, you know, bespoke kind right. of uh, tailored box of clothes or, you know, makeup, I suppose, or uh, food, food boxes, that kind of thing. Do you see much success with a, a more sort of custom approach? Um, so we don't have a lot of people doing it quite that way just because um, it's less reliant on automation as it is on the, the customization part. Um, so, but but yes, I think it's possible. It just comes down to the, the level of engagement information you're getting from people. Um, that's, that's typically more of like a, uh, there's a lot of work to prepare those boxes, but also you're looking more for the wow and the impressive mm -hmm. effect. Um, and it's less about like, you know, scaling the, you know, a bottle of CBD that you're selling to a million people. Yeah, definitely. Good. But All there's right. certainly like stitch fixes like running into some issues and they've been kind of the leader in that space for a few years now. Yeah, I think there would, there would be, wouldn't there? Like logistical issues. How do you, you know, how do you customize at scale? I mean, that's always going to be an issue, isn't it? So, right. Yeah. Right. Good. Uh, so just wrapping up then, anything that I haven't asked you that I should ask you or you feel is important to share with people that are just getting started on the subscription journey? Yeah, I would just, uh, you know, just maybe double down on that idea of like, communicating with customers and getting a little more feedback on what people like about your product, what they're expecting out of your product, I think is a really good thing to know yeah. because you can use that in your marketing materials and how you're positioning yourself um, from month to month, from order yeah. to order. Yeah. Should every brand owner be looking to add subscription uh, avenues to their brand? Is that too much? Uh, people, uh, can people force it, it too much? I, I I don't think it's getting forced. Well, I, it does get forced. Um, I think it's something you should look at. 
there are there's just really kind of like two different approaches. There's one where this is something I'm just going to add, and if people do it, cool. And I'm going to put in some software to automate it, and I'm going to build a couple flows. I'm not going to invest heavily in it and see how it goes. Um, and so for a lot of times, I think that's not it's not that hard to actually just kind of get going and start offering that and fulfilling that, especially if again if you're just doing like a a consumable product that it seems like it would fit. So I think it's not too hard to get that off the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, the one that requires a lot more thought and purpose is something that's like, you want to go kind of go all in on it, right? I want to launch ads specifically for this. I want a product page that's designed for this. Um, and, and that is the, again, the time where I was like, you know, just be careful around that. If you can launch an MVP without going, making a huge investment in it and start gathering data on what people like and don't like, yeah. um, that is always the pro the process I would recommend for any good experiment with an e-com. Yeah. Nice. Nice. And I know I said last question, but that made me think of another one. Um, you said you said about product page. Um, any kind of uh, tips, words of advice for a product page that is optimized for subscriptions? Yeah. So, like most, you're gonna go with some of the still the basic rules, right? Around great product photography, um, great titles. Um, you definitely want to lead with uh, benefit. Um, benefit rich copy Mm -hmm. um an experiment you could try is defaulting to the subscription option um some some brands find success with that some don't um but i would certainly um work on looking at what um what it looks like for somebody that's using the product regularly right so for me a good example is i take i take delta 8 cbd for sleep Mm -hmm. so you know if uh, you're selling delta 8 there's a a lot of different reasons that can get bought. So maybe you have a couple different variations where you're directing people and one of them is sleep and it's talking all about what life is like taking Delta eight every day. And that means you're getting a full night's sleep. You're getting, you know what I mean? You, you want to evoke the outcome for people so that they start thinking like, okay, yeah, maybe I do need this all the time so I can have that. Yeah. That's where I would start with everything and then play. You can always experiment with discounts and stuff after the fact too. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a lot of the core principles that we would talk about for, um, you know, converting a, a standard sale are going to be very much applicable to subscriptions. It's just the, d- the yeah. delivery of that on the back end. Right, exactly. And just how you're making sure you're tracking it like you would any other um, experiment, right? Yeah. Like you're you're tracking your conversions, uh, who's touching the subscription button versus not, yeah. you know, hitting, hitting that frequency option and then see what motions you can do to increase that activity and ultimately yeah. result in a sale. Yeah, definitely. Good. So uh, finally, then on on Qpilot, that's that's helping uh, store owners manage all this stuff. Um, tell us a bit about that and where people can find out some more. Yeah, absolutely. So you can visit visit us at Qpilot dot com if you'd like to learn more. Um, we really do really well with people that are seeing either delivery or shipping outcomes that they need to be a little bit different, a little bit better. Um, that is like if you're having more product variations and or you know we've got brands that are doing delivery. Um, like people can switch from shipping to a local delivery pickup option within the subscription order. That's stuff that we do really, really well, as well as data around change. So uh, if you're just a set and forget it static subscription, we can still probably help, but that's not what our bread and butter is. It's around subscriptions that can change. Yeah, nice. And so is Q, the letter Q, pilot.com? Yes, that's correct. Yep. Good stuff. We'll leave obviously the link in the description and the show notes, etc. But just in case people want to head there and, and check it out, uh, that's great, uh, Matthew. Thanks for joining us on the show today. I feel like that's really uh, some super helpful information, some different angles that I probably didn't expect it to go in, which I think is really helpful. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing your knowledge. Absolutely, it's been a pleasure, Ben. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. I hope you got a lot of value out of that. Do explore the idea of subscriptions because it can obviously really help your uh, income month to month, but also the value of your brand. Definitely worth exploring. Check out Qpilot. In, it, the link will be in the description, the show notes below, and uh, check out all they have to offer there. And we'll see you in the next episode real soon.